The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled A Clinical Compass for Selecting the Sequencing HER2 Targeting Therapies in HER2 Positive Metastatic Breast Cancer, an update on the latest evidence, guidelines, and expert insights. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash MVX860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this program, a Clinical Compass for Selecting and Sequencing HER2-Targeted Therapies in HER2-Positive Metastatic Breast Cancer. We're going to be reviewing an update on the latest evidence guidelines, and I'll be providing my insights. My name is Dr. Reshma Matani. I'm Chief of Breast Medical Oncology at Miami Cancer Institute, Baptist Health, South Florida, and I am pleased to be with you here today. So here are our goals. I hope at the end of this program, I'll have helped you augment your knowledge of the current and evolving role of the new treatments and some of our existing therapies that we've utilized for HER2-positive breast cancer, and that you'll be equipped with skills to optimally integrate these agents into developing an individualized treatment plan uh, and selecting and sequencing these therapies throughout the disease continuum for your patients in clinic. So let's start with module one. We'll go through what we're calling a toolkit for HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. And here in this session, we'll be focusing on the latest evidence and guidelines. I think it's always useful as we discuss HER2 positive disease to sort of uh, take a big step back and look at the progress that we've made. And you'll notice that this is a very busy slide, which is good news for our patients because it means that we have considerably expanded the armamentarium of agents for the treatment of HER2 positive disease. And you see the general classes of these therapies illustrated for you in this graphic. On the top upper left-hand side, you'll notice that there are monoclonal antibodies detailed. Of course, we're all very familiar with trastuzumab, the first treatment that we had uh, targeting this subtype of breast cancer. We also have pertuzumab, and then more recently, margituximab, the FC-engineered monoclonal antibody. You'll notice these therapies are larger. They work on the outside of the cell. We have smaller molecules like tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are uh, detailed for you on the bottom left-hand side. These drugs work inside uh, the cell. And then, of course, we have our new class of therapies, antibody drug conjugates. These are targeted delivery um, uh, agents of uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy directly targeting a specific antigen, in this case HER2, on the surface of these cancer cells. And you'll notice now that we have um, uh, antibody drug conjugates approved and many in the pipeline, so to speak. And there are more therapies to come, including bispecific antibodies, vaccines, CAR T cell therapy. Uh, We'll be talking about some of these in detail later in the session where we'll review novel treatments that are in development. All of these therapies ultimately are working to um, uh, impact proliferation, survival, and angiogenesis, and of course, ultimately result in cell death. So at last count, we have eight approved therapies and uh, hopefully more to come. Again, speaking to the progress that we've made in targeting HER2. So with that in mind, let's now move into a discussion of what standard first-line therapy for metastatic breast cancer would be, and that is dual monoclonal antibody treatment with pertuzumab and trastuzumab in combination with chemotherapy. And we are now um, uh, uh, shown here the long-term survival that we see, the end-of-study results of the pivotal Cleopatra study, which looked at Uh, adding pertuzumab to this backbone of trastuzumab and ataxane. And what you see here is uh, a pretty significant um, uh, improvement in median progression-free survival of 18.7 months associated with the pertuzumab arm, as well as an improvement in overall survival, 57.1 months again. And what I'll just uh, draw to your attention here as we look at these uh, curves is uh, a couple things. One, please remember this median PFS of 18.7 months in the first line with our standard treatment, because we'll come back to that and put it in context uh, to some of the newer data that we have with uh, an antibody drug conjugate. 
The other thing I'll call out here is um, there is about 15 to 16 uh, percent uh, tail on this curve as far as, you know, the number of patients that are still doing well and alive and progression free at this time point. And what that kind of alludes to is this thought that are there a certain uh, subpopulation of metastatic breast cancer patients who are potentially curable and are doing very, very well long term. Again, speaking to some of the uh, uh, newer approaches that are being investigated, um, and we'll, we'll circle back to that later as well. Uh, now, beyond first line, as we think of second line therapy after standard treatment, uh, which now includes pertuzumab, but many of these trials uh, looked at patients that had had prior taxane and trastuzumab, we start to uh, have discussions regarding a newer novel type of treatment um, an antibody drug conjugate. And the first one that we had available was TDM1. Now, TDM1 is an antibody drug conjugate that has an antimicrotubule uh, inhibitor as the chemotherapy payload, as you see here in this um, table that summarizes the attributes of uh, these two ADCs. The newer generation ADCs of which TDXD or trastuzumab deruxtecan is our newer drug, you see the topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, so a different payload here. Um, you'll also notice differences in the drug to antibody ratio with um, TDXD having many more molecules per, um, per antibody, so 8 to 1 as compared to 3.5 to 1 with TDM1, and then differences in the cleavability of the linker, which then relates to the ability of that uh, chemotherapy payload to drift out of the cancer cell to other cells that are expressing lower levels of the target, HER2, and has led to an approval in HER2 low disease for TDXD, um, uh, where we don't see that with TDM1. So here's progress here. In, in targeting uh, HER2 with, um, with uh, antibody drug conjugates. Now, as I mentioned, TDM1 was our first antibody drug conjugate that we had available, and it used to be standard second-line therapy for the majority of our patients based on the AMELIA trial. But this study, the Destiny Breast 3 trial, uh, changed that paradigm because here we had a head-to-head -head comparison of these two antibody drug conjugates, TDXD versus TDM1. Uh, these were patients that had previously been treated with trastuzumab and taxane in the advanced or metastatic setting. And you'll notice that there um, was a stratification based on hormone receptor status, prior uh, treatment with pertuzumab, about two-thirds of patients had prior pertuzumab, and of course, a history of visceral disease with the primary endpoint here being progression-free survival. So I asked you to remember that 18-month median PFS in the Cleopatra trial because what we saw here in a later line setting was a median PFS of 28.8 months with TDXD as compared to 6.8 months with uh, trastuzumab and tansine or TDM1. So I think that really uh, is, is really remarkable when you think of how we usually see efficacy play out. There's this um, concept of the law of diminishing returns, right? Usually you see your most effective treatments giving you the longest um, uh, progression-free survival first line, and then you see that dwindle with time. But here we see a highly active agent in the second line setting, giving us this really long median PFS, which uh, sort of gives us a hint of what we may see in the future as we use this treatment earlier on. The other thing that I'll just point out is if you look at the uh, the um, TDM1 arm, 6.8 months, that's a little bit less um, robust than what we saw in the AMELIA trial that I had mentioned. And this is a slide that actually summarizes um, some of the other uh, agents in, in the setting of uh, prior taxane and trastuzumab therapy. And of course, you know, TDM1 in that AMELIA trial, we saw about 9.6 months. Um, of course, you know, the DBO3 trial I mentioned, those patients had prior treatment with pertuzumab, and that may have influenced how that uh, uh, TDM1 arm did. The other point I'll make with this slide is looking at some of the other available agents, you see that bar being so much higher with TDXD of 28.8 months, uh, really outperforming 
many of the other uh, therapies that are available in these patients um, in this setting. So on that basis, you know, we're really um, kind of betting on this trial showing that TDXD in the first line setting may have a role. And I don't think it is a huge gamble to suspect that we will see uh, one of the TDXD arms uh, being the winner, so to speak, here. Um, and what does that mean for the future as we think of using this agent either alone in combination with pertuzumab, uh, uh, depending on you know what the data are as, as they get presented? Um, well, for certain patients, it may be a, um, a, a useful strategy, but Quality of life really is very important here. And we know usually when we give the Cleopatra regimen and then drop that taxane and continue monoclonal antibody therapy alone, uh, many patients are feeling very well. So how will that factor into to the, the treatment selection? That remains to be seen and, of course, uh, will be dependent on the individual patient and, of course, the efficacy data. As we look at the efficacy or the toxicity data um, in DBO3, you see here summarized the most common treatment emergent adverse events in 20% or more of patients. And as we have utilized this therapy more and more now, we see that there are some hematologic issues that are highlighted here, but the main issue is really nausea. And I think in my practice, I've been very successful in handling that with the use of appropriate antiemetics. Patients tend to do very well. You can get that under control. Um, it is important to point out the risk of alopecia with TDXD. And in terms of TDM1, as we've utilized this ADC for many years, we know that it can have some toxicity with regards to AST, ALT elevation, and uh, thrombocytopenia as well. So um, this is a really important adverse event to highlight with uh, TDXD, ILD pneumonitis. And in prior trials, there were some grade five events, meaning deaths. Uh, so this is something that we all have to be very mindful of when we think of utilizing this agent. In the DBO3 trial, you'll notice that there were no grade four or five um, ILD pneumonitis events, uh, but all grade ILD in the TDXD arm was about 15%. Uh, what I think it's important to just highlight here is here's where we really need to um, pay attention to patients, their symptoms, and educating them about potential uh, signs and symptoms of this uh, side effect. And we'll talk a bit later in the program about monitoring for ILD um, and how we can incorporate CT scans and things of that sort to, to hopefully catch this early so that patients are uh, recovering and able to uh, do well on this highly effective treatment. So what about beyond um, uh, a, a second line? So most of these uh, trials now looking at third line therapy and beyond uh, are in patients that have had prior exposure to TDM1. And this single arm phase two study uh, the Destiny Bresto 1 study was our first trial with TDXD that actually led to approval of this therapy. And that was on the basis of this really um, robust and, and exciting waterfall plot that I think has left an indelible impression in everyone's mind. You see each of those downward bars representing a patient responding, uh, and the response rate of 60.9% was really remarkable to see in this heavily pretreated population. Remember, all these patients had been exposed to TDM1, so we see here the activity of this ADC in patients that have had exposure to TDM1 and led to accelerated approval in December of 2019. And then we... Um, uh, saw this data, the Destiny Bresto 2 study. At this point, we were already utilizing TDXD even in the second line because the DBO3 trial, which I had shown you earlier, that head to head comparison firmly planted TDXD as our second line choice. But this trial was required to be done. The randomized study, again, looking at patients that had previous exposure to TDM1 
and were um, uh, then randomized to TDXD versus treatment of physician's choice. And no surprises here to see um, TDXD perform really well, better than treatment of physician's choice, which here included trastuzumab, capecitabine, or lapatinib, capecitabine. You see an improvement in progression-free and overall survival uh, associated with the TDXD arm. Now, moving on to another type of therapy, HER2-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitors, in that cartoon that we started with, we talked about these molecules being smaller drugs that work intracellularly, and our first available TKI was lapatinib. You'll notice that here, as shown in this uh, graphic, it targets HER1 and HER2, Neratinib, the pan-HER2 inhibitor, targets HER1, HER2, and HER4. And you see the difference here with tocatinib, which has high specificity to HER2 receptors compared to lapatinib and neratinib, uh, which, again, also bind to those other HER receptors. And here, uh, without having the target of EGFR, it may have impacted some of the EGFR-mediated side effects that we see with other TKIs, specifically lapatinib uh, as compared, lapatinib and neratinib as compared to, 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 to catnib. Now, as we think of neratinib, uh, some of us have some familiarity with this drug already as it's approved in the extended adjuvant setting as well for high-risk early stage patients. This trial was a phase three study that led to the expanded indication of neratinib in the metastatic setting in combination with CAPE cytobine. The NALA trial, this was a comparison of neratinib plus CAPE versus lapatinib plus CAPE. And what we saw here was an improvement in mean progression-free survival on the order of about two months, but no overall survival benefit. And um, you know, we'll come back to, to the tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, options that we have, but I think in my practice, I have a hard time justifying the use of neratinib when we have other drugs like tocatinib available, especially based on the toxicity profile as compared to tocatinib as well. Um, so speaking of tocatinib, now we move into this really important trial, the HER2 CLIMB study. This was a very large randomized study where we looked to see the addition or the impact of the addition of tocatinib to this backbone of trastuzumab and capecitabine. These were patients that had all had prior exposure to trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and TDM1. And what was really unique about this study was the fact that um, the investigators allowed patients on with brain metastases, which in other studies have routinely included patients with stable brain metastases, but here patients even with active or unstable brain mets. So everyone had a baseline brain MRI and there were some, some patients found without a prior history of brain mets to have brain metastases as long as they were uh, two centimeters or less, not requiring immediate local therapy, or had progression of known brain metastases, these were considered active brain mets. And these patients would have not been uh, enrolled on other trials, but were permitted to enroll here. Two to one randomization as shown. And um, the primary endpoint was progression-free survival, secondary endpoint overall survival. And what we saw was an improvement in both progression-free and overall survival, uh, about a five-and-a-half-month improvement in overall survival and the updated um, uh, follow-up, and an improvement also in progression-free survival, the hazard ratio of 0.57, again, favoring the incorporation of tocatinib. Now, more recently at San Antonio, we heard the HER2 CLIMB 2 uh, study, and these were results that were just recently presented. This was a randomized phase three placebo-controlled trial evaluating whether adding to catnib to TDM1 improved outcomes for patients with HER2-positive um, metastatic disease after trastuzumab and ataxane in any setting. Importantly, in this trial, patients were allowed on even, um, again, if they had brain meds, even if they were a stable, progressing, or even previously untreated brain meds. 
the primary endpoint was progression-free survival by investigator assessment. And there was a hierarchical statistical design here such that if the primary analysis for PFS was positive, that would trigger the first of two interim uh, overall survival analyses. I should mention that uh, in terms of uh, patient characteristics, baseline demographics, these were fairly well balanced. I won't be showing you this information. It is notable that about 44% of patients enrolled did have brain metastases, and half of those had active brain metastases, and the median prior number of prior therapies uh, was one. Uh, patients had not had prior exposure to TDXD, which is really important. And about 90% of these patients did have prior pertuzumab. So what did we see in terms of the efficacy? We saw that the addition of tacatinib to TDM1 significantly improved median PFS. You see the absolute improvement was about two months, hazard ratio of 0.76. Um, and because of uh, because of the hierarchical uh, statistical uh, testing design, it wasn't possible to statistically test the benefit of um, the benefit in patients with brain mets. But however, what the investigators saw was um, a very strong trend uh, in favor of the tacatinib arm. And here you see the hazard ratio of 0.64. In terms of overall survival, the because again, the primary analysis was statistically significant, this did prompt the first interim analysis of OS. Uh, it's important to point out here that this was an immature analysis. There was only 53% of, um, of overall survival events that, that were observed at the time of the analysis. And there was no statistically significant difference in overall survival between the two arms at this early time point. I'll just point out, as you look at this curve, you'll notice that up to about 18 months, uh, the overall survival curves completely overlap. But again, remember the data are very immature here. There are only about two years of median follow-up in patients, and um, there was a lot of censoring that happened after that 18-month time point, which may explain why those curves started to cross over. So we really do need to wait for additional um, follow-up here uh, to understand the true survival benefit, if there is one, to this approach. Um, so as we finish up, uh, just some final comments on HER2 CLIMB2. I think it's really an important trial because it is another look at this highly active agent to catnib. It's the second largest or the second large randomized trial to show a benefit to uh, incorporating to catnib to standard systemic therapy. And also very importantly, it's the second large randomized trial that allowed patients on who had active or progressive brain mets. And as we move forward in designing these clinical trials, I think it's really important that we not exclude these patients because we are seeing them in our clinical practice and uh, we need data-driven uh, information on how to appropriately manage them. So now as we move into the second section, focusing on brain metastases, um, it is uh, important to just overall look at the incidence of brain metastases in breast cancer. We know that breast cancer is one of the most common causes of brain mets and leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. The incidence, depending on the series that you look at, is somewhere around 20 to, I would say, up to about 50% as you go down um, the various lines of treatment in HER2-positive disease. Um, Fortunately, we have uh, targeted treatments for our patients and they're doing well, but the other side of that is now they're living longer and they are uh, developing brain metastases. And how we treat these patients, of course, depends on various factors. As shown here in the pie chart, you'll see 16% um, of, uh, of the pie chart it accounts for uh, breast cancer in terms of brain metastases. And that has um, been pretty consistent, but increasing over time as we think of, again, how our systemic therapies are controlling uh, systemic disease and allowing patients to develop brain metastases with time. 
As we think of some of the tools that we have in our toolbox for these patients, uh, of course, we do have our surgical and radiation colleagues, and surgery may be appropriate for um, an individual patient, especially in a patient who presents with a, 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 a single brain met or a, a few brain mets that are causing local edema, and they're very symptomatic. There may be a need to take them to the OR. Um, they may not have any other sites of systemic disease. And we know that certain patients do very well with aggressive local therapy approaches uh, long-term. So these should certainly be considered. And then of course, the really important information that we can get if we get the pathology from that brain met with some uh, studies indicating that the the um, the information from that pathology in terms of genes that are expressed, the gene expression profile of these uh, tumors in the brain may be different than what is uh, in the systemic um, uh, sites. So I think those would be reasonable uh, reasons to consider surgery in the appropriate patient. But I do think that we are now utilizing other local treatments like radiation more frequently, and our radiation oncology colleagues tell us about how their uh, treatment modalities have improved. Um, and of course, we always try to avoid whole brain radiation therapy and utilize SRS when possible for up to 10 lesions, and that number seems to always be going up. Uh, because, of course, we know the toxicities of whole brain radiation and how that can be tough for not only patients, uh, also their families as they see some of the neurocognitive decline that can occur, which is really hard um, for patients and their families to go through. And fortunately, on the medical oncology side, we've made uh, consistent progress in treating uh, patients with brain metastases with systemic therapies, we see a new era of treatment of HER2 positive tumors with um, treating them with the, some of these newer agents like tyrosine kinase inhibitors. We've gone through the tacatinib data in the HER2 CLIMB study. Uh, there are other other smaller agents that are in development. And of course, now we have antibody drug conjugates. And what I'll share with you in the next several slides are some of the data that are really challenging this thought that these newer novel ADCs that are fairly larger molecules cannot get into the brain because we are seeing some really robust and, and um, uh, encouraging activity, uh, of course, um, that needs to be validated in larger randomized studies, but an early hint that these drugs do in fact uh, penetrate the CNS and you can see some um, pretty remarkable uh, responses. But the overarching question of is systemic therapy the best option for patients with brain mets and HER2 positive disease versus, you know, some of the local uh, treatment options that I detailed, which, which one is a better strategy? Of course, we don't have randomized data to make those decisions, but uh, we certainly do have uh, several tools in our toolbox, um, so to speak. Now, as we look back at some of our uh, data sets in, in terms of um, patients with brain mets specifically, I already showed you the data, the long-term data from Cleopatra, but adding the information about brain metastases, remember this, is a, this was a first-line trial, so there were very few patients that at baseline had brain metastases that went on. But what we saw was in the pertuzumab group, um, the incidence of brain metastases did not um, differ in, between the two groups as they progressed. But what we did see was that there was a significantly increased time to the development of brain metastases. So are we implying here that pertuzumab delayed the incidence of brain metastases or decrease the risk of brain metastases? No, I think the thought here is really that the systemic disease, again, was uh, well controlled for a longer period of time, and then those patients ultimately developed brain metastases. And as we think of some of the other data sets, for example, we've gone through the Destiny Bresto 3 trial, which was that head-to-head -head comparison. Again, highlighted here for you on this slide is the information that here only 82 patients had clinically stable, previously treated uh, breast cancer brain metastases were allowed. So the information that we have 
as far as patients that uh, were treated with this drug in a large prospective study uh, is not there, but we're going to go through some of the information that we do have on the efficacy of um, patients with uh, treated with brain metastases and ADCs, specifically here at TDXD. Um, we saw that progression-free and overall survival benefit that I already um, uh, pointed out earlier with the DBO3 data. But again, focusing on those patients that had these uh, clinically stable treated brain metastases, the first take home point on this slide is that this information is of course prognostic. Patients with brain mets don't do as well as patients who do not have brain mets. But the other um, take home point here is the benefit again in patients with or without brain mets of TDXD as compared to TDM1. And that's illustrated for you here. Now, as far as the intracranial response uh, per Blinded Independent Central Review, um, we, we have that information highlighted here. It's important to note that uh, we had unknown previous radiation status for these patients, but we do see um, an intracranial overall response rate that is uh, pretty impressive, 64% compared to 33% with TDM1, again, pointing to the activity of this agent in the brain. And then very importantly, there was this pooled analysis of TDXD in HER2 positive uh, metastatic breast cancer patients with brain mets from all of these trials, Destiny Breast 01, 2, and 3. And these data were presented um, last year at ESMO by Sarah Hurwitz. I'll just point out um, that, again, in Destiny Breast 01, patients had to have clinically stable brain mets. In originally, the Destiny Breast 02 and 3 trials did allow patients with active brain mets on, then there was an amendment that did not allow them on. So we're talking about small numbers here, but you see all of the various trials, DBO1, DBO2, and DBO3, um, and the comparator arm, remember there was no comparator arm in DBO1, it was a non-randomized uh, single arm phase two study, but you see the comparator arm uh, highlighted here, the study design, and here we're looking at specifically patients uh, with brain mets. And what did we see? Well, we saw this intracranial overall response rate of uh, in the mid 40s, which again is um, a pretty impressive number to see as compared to somewhere around 10 to 20% in the comparator brain met uh, pool of patients, again, with that comparator arm being different depending on uh, the trial with uh, DBO3, it was TDM1, uh, and with DBO2, it was um, the lapatinib uh, or, or trastuzumab. So again, um, here there's some encouraging data that in this pooled analysis, we see a response uh, with TDXD. Uh, what about specifically CNS progression-free survival? Uh, again, TDXD demonstrated a trend towards prolonged CNS progression-free survival over the comparator. Um, you'll notice this huge difference in the curves in terms of untreated active brain mets versus treated stable brain mets. Remember, the comparators were different here. It's difficult with cross-study designs. Uh, what I would say is that there's a noticeably greater advantage in the untreated brain mets, but I, it's hard to make much of that. It's just more to recognize the activity that this uh, ADC likely has in patients with brain metastases. So what about going forward, um, looking at this in a prospective fashion? Well, we do have some uh, smaller data sets. Here, we have a very small study of looking at the efficacy of TDXD in patients with newly diagnosed untreated brain mets or brain mets progressing after previous local therapy with prior exposure to uh, trastuzumab, putuzumab, and no indication for local therapy. You see the prior therapy, a large percentage of these patients, again, there are only 15 in the trial, had received prior uh, TDM1. And what we see here is an overall response rate of 73.3%, which at first glance seems really uh, high. But remember, these are small numbers. Look at the confidence intervals here, 48 to 89 
but still um, a lot of downward bars here. And I think uh, this is an early hint that we are potentially seeing activity here. And that's good news, of course, for our patients. Here you see the progression-free survival of 14 months uh, with TDXD in the tuxedo um, in the Tuxedo 1 trial and the extracranial response rates uh, also illustrated for you on the bottom. And then, of course, we also have the DEBRA data. Now, this is a multi-cohort trial. It was an open-label, single-arm, multi-cohort phase two study of TDXD. Here, we were looking at not only patients with HER2 positive disease, uh, there were patients also with HER2 low disease. You see the various cohorts. There was an untreated brain met um, cohort. There was even a cohort five that had meningeal carcinomatosis. There was some data presented um, just recently at San Antonio. And we look at the primary endpoints of overall response rate intracranially for cohorts two and three with the primary endpoint cohort one 16 week PFS. So again, just focusing on intracranial response rates, what do we see? Um, again, very impressive, 44 to 50% in cohort two and three. These are responses intracranially in the brain. And with patients uh, with measurable intracranial or extracranial disease, you see, again, a very high um, overall response rates with manageable toxicity and maintained quality of life. We also have some real world data. This was a Japanese study looking at patients that had TDXD. Uh, we were looking to evaluate the effectiveness of, of patients in a real world setting who had uh, brain metastases or leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. And again, both active and stable. This was a chart review. Uh, again, the take home point is you see these higher than expected numbers in, in the patients um, who were treated with TDXD. Again, we have a small N, it's 51, um, but 54%, uh, 62% or 63% total uh, intracranial overall response rate. So um, quite encouraging. As we put the smaller data sets um, in context to some of the other information that we have, and we look at this uh, on the whole, uh, there was um, a look at all of these trials and kind of summarizing what the response rates were across all of these studies. It was around 61, 62% across the board with TDXD, which is very reminiscent of that Destiny Bresto 1 uh, overall response rate, that waterfall plot that I pointed out earlier, which showed the activity as a whole. So making the point that here there may be um, a very similar activity in the CNS for this antibody drug conjugate. Now, moving on, as we consider uh, tacatinib, this was a very important study in terms of patients with um, brain mets, again, where we saw the confirmed overall response rate intracranially of around 47%. Uh, here we have the largest uh, data-driven approach for patients with um, brain metastases, as this trial really did have a large number of patients, approximately half that had brain metastases. And we saw, again, that uh, intracranial response rate of 47% in, in patients with uh, uh, brain mets. Here we see the updated, act, uh, updated overall survival in patients with active uh, brain mets. Um, again, Median OS was 9.1 months longer in the tacatinib arm, uh, and then that's broken down by active uh, as well as treated and stable brain met. So clearly a very, very active uh, agent for patients with brain metastases. So putting, putting this all together, we have other drugs and combinations that are being evaluated. Uh, we see other tyrosine kinase inhibitors. We had mentioned the NALA data and the neratinib plus CAPE uh, combination, which is another available combination. Again, harder to justify the use of neratinib when we have this highly active tacatinib regimen. I will say that this idea of sequencing TKIs is also another area of interest. We don't know if there will be sequential activity of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors. We do see some activity um, with TDM1, but we're seeing really encouraging activity, as I pointed out, with TDXD, and we will be hopefully seeing more information in a prospective fashion with TDXD.
As we think of how to optimally manage these patients with brain metastases, I would just point out the importance of multidisciplinary collaborative approaches. Um, we now have options that I've highlighted that include local strategies as well as systemic therapies, and there are sort of pros and cons of all of these approaches. Of course, in patients with a smaller number of lesions, um, SRS may be considered, surgery may be considered in a specific patient, a larger uh, lesion that's requiring um, immediate local control because there's edema and patients are very symptomatic, may be a patient that you may consider for surgery up front, of course, in collaboration with our uh, neurosurgical colleagues. If there's edema, that's certainly a factor. And then again, as I pointed out, the need for tissue sometimes can dictate uh, a local approach. But as we move forward and making more and more advances in our systemic treatment, we know that HER2 positive disease is um, sort of one of our larger, greater success stories in, in treating breast cancer. And we've made considerable progress in even targeting brain metastases with some of the data that I've shown you, certainly more work that needs to be done. But for those patients who um, have HER2 positive disease, now that we're developing agents that get into the brain, that may uh, shift us towards considering more of a systemic approach, um, especially in patients that are asymptomatic, as we have um, agents that get into the brain um, and we can forego a hopefully whole brain radiation in certain patients. So as we close out this section of the discussion on brain metastases, the conclusions um, are shown for you that the incidence of brain mets in patients with HER2 positive disease is increasing. It's um, sort of a kind of paradox in a way because as we're doing better for our patients and controlling their disease systemically, they're living longer and that's great, but now we're seeing uh, this increasing incidence of, of brain metastases. It's important that we always individualize our approach and making sure that we're taking into account, of course, the data, um, but also recognizing the importance of the patient's voice and what they want and making sure that they're part of our treatment team, knowing that we would want to, for example, consider delaying radiation um, for as long as possible, specifically whole brain radiation. We are now seeing more and more encouraging data with TDXD and patients with brain mets. There's promising efficacy in several trials. I showed you some information that showed that the intracranial response rate is in the range of somewhere of 50 to 70% um, for those patients with active brain mets. And there is evidence of activity as second line therapy um, before TDM1. We have um, the largest randomized data with the tacatinib regimen. Uh, it's a large randomized phase two trial, but of course, the challenge here as we have both of these regimens available is that there's no head-to-head -head comparison with uh, TDXD. Standardizing clinical trials of patients uh, in this situation is an unresolved need. We're awaiting the Destiny Breast 12 trial which is our, going to be our largest prospective study uh, evaluating patients with active as well as stable brain metastases. As we think of um, this unmet need for our patients, uh, we know that many patients lack resources and information about diagnosis, treatment, management, and survivorship of CNS METs. And with that in mind, I'll just call to your attention the mbcbrainmets.org organization. This is a one-stop resource hub for patients with brain METs, and uh, they come together as a community to help support each other and provide specific information that's tailored to their needs. And uh, again, um, there's a medical advisory board, all the information is vetted. So this is an important resource that I would encourage you all to consider sharing with your patients. Now, as we move into a discussion of new and emerging uh, approaches with HER2 targeted therapy, I'll just point out um, a little hint of the future of what is um, possibly to come. And these are really exciting things to think about as we consider uh, our newer generation of ADCs will not only be able to deliver cyto one cytotoxic payload, but perhaps dual payload ADCs with non-overlapping toxicity. So basically, poly 
polychemotherapy in one drug, which is uh, really remarkable to think about. We know in ER positive breast cancer, the importance of some of these newer agents like Protax, they're under investigation and are showing a lot of promise, but here is the potential to, tar to couple the de degradation of proteins with antibodies with these newer generation antibody Protax conjugates. And then thinking of how we can utilize immune approaches, including immune stimulating antibody conjugates or ISACs, these agents have started to show some encouraging activity in HER2 positive disease. It'll be interesting to see if there's any synergy with checkpoint inhibitors or other drugs that we already utilize. And then of course the potential for radioimmunoconjugates. So it's remarkable to see that we are moving into a field where we may be able to um, uh, use antibody targeted uh, antibody drug uh, drugs to target uh, and deliver various uh, different payloads beyond just chemotherapy. So that's um, encouraging to see and exciting. And then, of course, we also have in the pipeline tri-specific antibodies. These are agents that force that connection between the tumor and the immune system. Uh, by by targeting um, both HER2 and um, uh, immune antigens. So this is, uh, again, another uh, important type of therapy to watch. Of course, there are other targets in HER2-positive breast cancer. They're shown for you here. HER3 is one where we've made um, a fair bit of progress with uh, a HER3-directed monoclonal antibody where we've seen some data. But of course, there are other targets, and some of these have been successful in GYN cancers like folate receptor, alpha, nectin-4, and of course there are others. So hopefully more targeted treatments for our patients with HER2-positive disease. As we think of all of the progress we've made, it's tempting, again, to consider in a very specific patient to give them a lot of our active agents and see if, for example, in de novo metastatic breast cancer patients that are HER2-positive, where we know a subset of these patients do very well for many, many years, is there the potential to, to even render them cured? Um, so that's being investigated in the context of this trial called SAFO, intensifying first-line treatment for patients with de novo HER2-positive disease. And you see these patients go through these 12 weeks of our most highly active therapy and then being followed. So whether this will or will not be a successful strategy is something that we'll have to see. Again, this is a small kind of um, uh, uh, proof of concept study in a small number of patients, but would be really interesting to see uh, this approach bear out. And then now we move into a comprehensive approach to decision-making, optimizing treatment selection and sequencing of HER2-targeted therapies with a focus on the guidelines. Now, here you see systemic therapy regimens for uh, HER2-positive, unresectable, or stage 4 disease per NCCN. And I won't belabor this slide too much because we've already gone through the data sets that have informed these recommendations for THP or trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and uh, taxane in the first line setting based on the Cleopatra trial. In the second line, the majority of our patients will get trastuzumab deruxtecan based on the DBO3 trial that we went through. There is the opportunity, especially in patients with CNS METs, to offer the HER2 climb regimen with tecatinib, trastuzumab, and CAPE in the appropriate second line patient, but the majority of patients will receive that therapy third line what the role is of TDM1, um, it's still uh, something that I think we are all trying to grapple with, but it is a very well-tolerated ADC that we're all very familiar with, and certainly our patients are doing very well for many years, so having it available is still a good thing for our patients. And then you see fourth line and beyond, we have various options with the optimal sequence not being um, entirely clear. And so as I go through this algorithm, uh, I sort of walked you through it already in the slide that we just looked at, um, how to make the decision in the second line, uh, TDXD or tecatinib trastuzumab capecitamine, I or tecatinib trastuzumab capecitamine. I think the majority of our patients will be getting TDXD. There may be an occasional patient who has a very high CNS burden that you may consider the tecatinib regimen second line. I think for most of us, we would be utilizing that third line and beyond. 
of course, this question of the activity of TDM1 um, post TDXD, we certainly have the information in the reverse, but will there be activity with TDM1 post TDXD remains to be seen. And as we think of individualizing our treatment options in the fourth line and beyond, we have to, of course, consider various factors, uh, including patient choice, um, prior uh, toxicities from prior treatments, and um, again, having newer agents in the pipeline with more options, hopefully, to come. So now we'll move into the um, third and last module, case-based discussion, as we think of how we can apply some of the data that I've just taken you through into integrating an appropriate um, personalized treatment plan for a, a hypothetical patient here. So this is a 68-year-old woman who presented to clinic for newly diagnosed metastatic breast cancer. It's important to um, highlight her original history here. The original diagnosis was with a small node negative invasive breast cancer that was triple positive four years ago. Now, we know many of our patients with early stage HER2 positive disease are doing really well. In fact, the APT regimen, which is weekly uh, paclitaxel trastuzumab for 12 weeks, followed by completion of trastuzumab uh, to complete a year has resulted in a really good efficacy outcomes for the majority of our patients uh, in the early stage setting with these small node negative tumors and they're doing well and, and cured. Um, this woman went through breast conserving therapy and then lost to follow up, which I think is a really, really important point in this case. She didn't receive any systemic therapy. So here we see sort of the natural history of this disease play out in that she developed metastatic disease. So even with a small node negative tumor, this is an aggressive cancer left untreated. And not unexpectedly, she returned four years later with abdominal fullness, right upper quadrant pain, and significant fatigue, and went to the emergency room where imaging revealed uh, an enlarged liver with multiple solid metastases elevation of transaminases, but synthetic function, coags, and, and bilirubin, and all of that was uh, within normal. Um, biopsy was done appropriately at the first diagnosis. We always want to confirm the diagnosis of metastatic disease, and we check biomarkers as those can change in a small percentage of patients. But here we saw the same tumor, ERPR positive, HER2, and importantly, she had no brain metastases at baseline. She had no symptoms. Uh, again, this brings up the issue of should we be doing brain imaging first line? But in, in this situation, she's um, presenting initially and has um, a systemic disease that is uh, considerable. So I think it would be a reasonable option. Uh, as we think of what treatment options we would recommend for frontline treatment, I think it's pretty clear based on the data that I shared with you that our regimen of ataxane, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab would be our recommendation. But again, as we think about some of the unique aspects of this case that may inform what we do, again, this woman didn't return for follow-up. She was lost to follow-up. So I think it's really important to, to um, drill down on, you know, what are some of those factors that allowed this patient to be lost to follow up? Were there some social factors? Uh, did she not want to go through chemotherapy at that time because she was very worried about the potential for hair loss? Is that now different? Were there transportation issues? Were there other social determinants of health that may be at play here that could have impacted her um, inability to get treatment early on? Because I think some of those same factors could influence what we do. Certainly a taxane, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab uh, would be optimal, but if she's having issues with getting to the uh, cancer center for weekly therapy, we may consider um, docetaxel every three weeks. We may consider subcutaneous trastuzumab, pertuzumab, that may be helpful. So again, individualizing the treatment is really important here. Of course, there is always the consideration for hormonal therapy and trastuzumab, pertuzumab. Uh, I would feel less comfortable with that approach given her marked um, involvement in the, uh, in the liver, but certainly if it came down to a 
situation where she said, I will not take uh, chemotherapy, I would be willing to consider it. But um, again, this case I think is important because it highlights some of the nuances of decision making and it's not always so clear when you have that person in front of you, um, what may be a textbook answer may not be applicable in, in terms of the patient in front of you. So we have varied the case a bit. What I'll point out on this slide that's different is now she develops instead of just liver metastases, um, a brain uh, MRI is done and she's found to have a single two centimeter brain met. And we're asking you to consider uh, what your frontline treatment would be for this patient now, and basically trying to drive home the, the question of, you know, how does brain involvement at presentation influence your choice of therapy. So what I would say is clearly here, what is dictating this woman's prognosis is her systemic disease. So I certainly would be moving quickly to get her on systemic therapy, but we certainly do need to address this brain metastasis. So I would be looking to uh, engage with our radiation colleagues and our neurosurgical colleagues to figure out what the best local approach would be. It seems like radiation would likely be the option there. Um, but clearly what's dictating her prognosis here is the systemic uh, treatment. And I would start trastuzumab, uh, pertuzumab, and ataxane if she was willing to consider and have that uh, brain met and get treated with uh, some local therapy. Now, um, here we see some follow-up on the patient. She is uh, uh, able to take standard treatment of a dual antibody therapy and a taxane, and after two cycles, she symptomatically much improved. This isn't unexpected, right? We see HER2 positive patients respond very quickly, and it's very gratifying as a physician to see these patients who come in really symptomatic and you're able to help them. After four cycles, she has a 70% reduction in tumor burden. After six cycles, a complete response in the liver. Quite remarkable. But then she develops moderate neuropathy uh, as well as edema related to the taxane. Um, even if she didn't, I think many of us would uh, be thinking of dropping chemotherapy after a sort of induction period, and many of our patients do well on HP alone for many, many years. Uh, um, at that point, she initiates an aromatase inhibitor concurrently with the HP, and that's something, again, in standard practice we're all doing. I will point out that there is a trial that's ongoing, the PATINA study, which is also looking to see if there is a benefit of adding a CDK inhibitor to endocrine therapy and HP in this setting as sort of a maintenance, which will be an interesting um, a study to follow. Uh, 20 months later, she develops progression in the liver. There's a new one centimeter metastasis. She also has lung metastases. And again, the question here is, which treatment options would you recommend for second line treatment of this patient? We went through the Destiny Breast 03 data, which showed a remarkable median PFS of 28 months uh, with TDXD in the second line. And this would be the patient that I certainly would be thinking of utilizing TDXD in the second line. Um, then you're asked to consider if the patient um, had no brain metastases at baseline, so that first initial presentation, but in the second line setting, she progressed not only systemically, but also in the CNS. So again, in that situation, of course, the tocatinib regimen is something that could be considered. I think this is not a, a cookie cutter approach. This has to be individualized. If the patient had a, um, a burden of disease that was still uh, quite high systemically, uh, here she has one one small liver met and lung mets. Is she symptomatic from those lung mets? I showed you some data showing that TDXD does have some activity that we're seeing in the CNS. It still may be a very consider uh, very appropriate option in the second line, uh, but then it would be a very different situation if she progressed and the bulk of her disease was CNS and she was very uh, symptomatic from that. That might be a patient that I would consider in the second line using the tocatinib regimen. So again, here it, it highlights the importance of individualizing our treatments for our patients. 
As far as um, brain imaging to uh, help select the next line of therapy, these are some of the questions that we've asked you to consider. Um, of course, you know, the evidence or the guideline uh, approach would be to not utilize brain imaging for patients that are asymptomatic. I will say that I think um, that that was really formulated in a time where we didn't have active agents in the CNS. So again, not a guideline approach, but there are patients that I may consider doing brain imaging, um, even if they're asymptomatic. Uh, and of course, the TDXD related nausea and vomiting, as I alluded to earlier, is something that I think we've gotten a good hold on as we think of using prophylactic antiemetics. Um, the question of screening uh, or scanning, rather, for ILD, I think this is something we're all grappling with as we have to understand the importance of catching this early. So in the clinical trials, scans were done every six weeks, and that becomes quite problematic in a real world setting. In my practice, every nine weeks or every three cycles, I've been doing that for at least the first year and considering moving it out to every 12 weeks um, beyond that. As we think of uh, how to manage ILD, that last question that, um, that was posed to you, this is a really important slide and uh, very informative for how we can detect and manage TDXD-related ILD, the five S rules. So this is um, something that was shared by Dr. Paolo Tarantino, the five S's, screen, scan, synergy, suspend treatment, and steroids. So this is a nice algorithm that just highlights um, how we can detect and manage this um, worrisome side effect, but we need careful patient selection is warranted before initiating TDXD and screening continues during treatment. So we have to educate our patients, make sure that they're aware of the side effect, some of the subtle findings, signs and symptoms that can be present. We need to follow with imaging, right? You can't find what you're not looking for. So recognizing the importance of routine screening CTs, synergize with our multidisciplinary collaborative team and getting our colleagues from ID pulmonary involved once ILD is suspected so that we can go through appropriately a differential diagnosis. Most importantly, suspend treatment. And this is something that I think is extremely important even for patients with grade one, meaning no symptoms just found on imaging. This guideline is different than what we're used to dealing with with some other agents. So there is the potential to rechallenge depending on how long it takes for grade one ILD to resolve on imaging. But for grade two or beyond, you're supposed to discontinue. And I think that's something that we're um, not used to with some of the other agents. But uh, in the interest of our patients, this is um, something that we have to be very mindful of. And of course, utilizing steroids. So as we finish the program, I'll just end with uh, my key takeaways and a bit of a summary. We've made considerable progress in treating HER2 positive disease. This was one of our most aggressive subtypes, and now we have eight targeted agents with multiple more in the pipeline to come. The uh, patients with brain metastases, this represents an important area of research. Fortunately, we've made some progress with uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors and some early data showing us um, that even antibody drug conjugates do have activity in the CNS. There are multiple novel uh, therapies on the horizon. And as we design these clinical trials, it's important that we need to include these patients specifically with brain mets into our study designs. The importance of highlighting or uh, individualizing rather treatment recommendations and utilizing the multidisciplinary team approach, I think is an important uh, takeaway. And lastly, I'll end with um, the plea that we have to do our part as providers to help empower patients to be their own best advocates, to make sure that they're part of the treatment team, to educate them on the side effects of the therapies and help them navigate these risk benefit uh, discussions uh, and help connect them to important uh, advocacy organizations that are doing really um, uh, great work. So thank you. And I appreciate your attention. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash MVX 860.
This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca and Daiichi Sankyo Incorporated.